president of Sea Glass Theatre Company. I'm here today to present another in our series of spotlight programs, which highlight performers in our programs. Today, we are focusing on Wailing Women, which is a world premiere being presented in New Bedford on October 2nd. And today's conversation is with the fabulous soprano, Diana McVeigh. I hope you enjoy it. Well, hello, Diana McVeigh. Hello, Elise. How are you? I'm, I'm wonderful. It's so good to talk to you. You too. It's been a while. Wonderful. Yes, it has. Let's start with the, at the very beginning with you. Where did you, when and where did you get inspired to use that magnificent instrument, uh, your voice? You know, um, I think my mother, although she was not a professional musician, she played piano and she sang. So, you know, in utero, I was sort of indoctrinated into it. But then I'm the youngest of four uh, girls and my oldest sisters are 12 and 11 years older than I am. And when I was about four or five, I got to see them perform in their high school Gilbert and Sullivan productions. And I was just so mesmerized. And at the time, obviously, I didn't realize I would follow that path for a career, but I knew I was going to sing in the choir. I knew I was going to do Gilbert and Sullivan productions just like they did. Wonderful. And where did you pursue your higher education? I, I have no idea where you studied. I studied at a state school here in Rhode Island, Rhode Island College. Um, I decided to go into music rather late. I thought I was going to follow a career in the Navy uh, because I was paying for college myself. I was the, the only one in my family to go to college at that time. And I didn't, I was afraid to be saddled with a lot of college debt, especially in music. You know, I wasn't sure what that was going to be. Um, and then it was rather late in my senior year where my uh, high school choral director, Bob Cleesby, said, you're making a mistake. You're going to miss music way too much. You need to, I think, think about this. And so he set up a few auditions for me at various schools in the New England area. And I settled on Rhode Island College because the tuition was a complete steal. It was so cheap. Uh, and it worked out. For me, it worked out. You know, sometimes the venue doesn't matter as much as the quality of the relationships and the professors and your your fellow students that you 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 live you feed off that, don't you? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And it was a great for me. It was a great setting because it was small. It wasn't so um, competitive. Because at the time, I I really wasn't all that talented singing wise. I could read music. I was a good musician, but my voice wasn't anything great at the time. So I think I would have been completely swallowed up at a conservatory kind of school. How did how did your voice develop into what it is today? And I mean, it is it is an amazing instrument. Oh, thank you. Well, a lot of practice, and I mean a lot of hours in a practice room. Um, you know, I heard arias that I wanted to sing when I was in school, and I just knew I couldn't. And so, when I first got to college, I couldn't even sing a high A. We were doing Messiah in chorus in college and it had a high A and I was, you know, getting the sweats over. And I was like, I can't sing that note. And it really bothered me. And then I heard Glitter and Be Gay, the aria from uh, Candide that has all these fireworks and high E flats. And I said, I'm going to learn to sing that. And I put myself in a practice room and I just practiced and practiced. And I mean, I practiced. And then one day with the help of my fantastic voice teacher at the time, it just started to open up. It just started to develop. Your vocal cords are so interesting as a, in everyone. You know, when, when, I, when I hear some of the speaking voices of younger girls especially, it puts me on edge because they don't, they don't realize they can control that and you can teach your voice to do certain things. So that's a, that's a perfect example of honing, honing it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I think you're talking about vocal fry, too, with the young girls who like sit. Oh, yeah. Big pet peeve of every singer on the planet. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. <laughs>
so you it, it you caught the bug and then you started getting these fabulous gigs and your gigs have continued throughout your career i mean you have such a a rich resume take us through the journey a little bit and hit some of the highlights of your favorite metamorphoses if you will <laughs> well you know i i started a little bit late in the performing career because out of college i worked for the rhode island philharmonic i went into arts management yeah because you know it was stable it was great and great organization and um so I started in the, the performing thing a little bit later than everybody else. I was in my late 20s when the great Maria Spacania came back to Rhode Island. She moved back, yes. She moved back from uh, New York to take care of her dad, who, who was elderly at the time. And I was looking for a new voice teacher. I was per still performing locally in New England, even though I was working full time for the Philharmonic. So I said, well, I better get another teacher. If I'm going to do this singing thing. I should get a new teacher. Well, one lesson with Maria Spacani. And I was like, OK, this is something I need to really focus on here. And over the course of, you know, a few months, I auditioned for some um, competitions, got to finals, won a couple of small ones you know, made it to the, the Met Regionals. So things were starting to happen. And simultaneously, I was pretty unhappy with the arts management job, not because the job was bad, but I, was, I wasn't happy in it. And my husband finally said, you know, I think you need to quit your job and go sing because there has to be something better for us to talk about at dinner than how much you hate your job. <laughs> So that was another like light bulb moment. And so I did it. I auditioned for a young arts, uh, young artist program in Sarasota, the Sarasota Opera Young Artist Program. And I got in and that was a three month thing in Sarasota, Florida. Um, and that was really the start of it. And that was by that time I was 30. And in the opera world, that's almost elderly already. So, you know, if you haven't done certain things by the time you're 30, it's a it's an uphill climb unless you sing Wagner in gigantic repertoire, you know, that takes a little bit longer to cook. So and then after that, I got into the Lake George Opera Program and I just started I just started catching the, the ears of people who didn't care about age or didn't care about where you went to school. They cared about can you do the job? Can you sing? Can you act? Can you read music? Are you a good colleague? Um, and so I just started getting gigs from there. And it's it's no coincidence that Maria Spacani was part of that mix. She's amazing. She's mm. just, she's not only an amazing talent, but and an amazing cook and an amazing human being and an amazing friend to, to when you can call her your friend. It's just. Yep, absolutely. She's, she's a peach. She's, she's the really, genuine deal. Yep. Oh, and Carnegie Mellon is lucky to have her. That's for oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's for sure. That's for sure. So tell me, tell me what your weirdest gig has been in, in, your, <laughs> in, in your tour. <laughs> That's easy. A, a, a production of Carmen in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates. Wow. What that happened to me? Weird. Well, first of all, it was Carmen in the Middle East, uh, you know, uh, Western music in the Middle East. Um, and it had, there were two concerts involved. It was a, a performance of Carmen, and then we did a, a concert the next night, um, opera to Broadway kind of a thing. Um, but in Carmen, I was playing Micaela, and you know, at the end of her aria, Jadi, she makes the sign of the cross. Yeah. So I, I kind of disguised it. I kind of did it, but kind of, you know, in a very non-specific kind of way. Um, and the audience, we you know, they were very polite, but they had to be asked, requested that they not smoke during the performance, right? Oh because it's, that's just, that's just their culture everywhere. So even in buildings, so we, they had to, and some people complied and some people didn't, we did the best we could. But then the next night when we did this opera to Broadway uh, concert, um, what the sponsor was a diamond uh, uh, dealer. So the women, we were all draped in diamonds. I had over a million dollars worth of diamonds on me. I had earrings and this big necklace and, and bracelets, but we had an armed, each one of us had an armed guard everywhere, everywhere we went. Wow. So I didn't drink a lot of water because I didn't want to <laughs> have to bring my friend with me to the bathroom. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Wow. Did they give you a gift? 
No, I wish they had, but they didn't. No, I thought they probably could have afforded earrings or something, right? I mean, Dubai, <laughs> dripping in money, they could have given you one stone. I know, right? Too no. funny. Too funny. Lovely people, but it was just, it was a surreal sort of thing. Yeah. That seems like another planet. It was. It was. Um, it was just sort of surreal. I stuck out like a beacon, you know, mm. even though Europeans go there and Australians go there a lot, for some reason, a blonde American was like a, this thing, like people would approach me in the lobby all the time and say, you're American, you're American, you're American, without me even speaking. Wow. Yeah. Scary and fun at the same time, I guess. Yeah, it made me think, it was honestly, it was the first time that I ever had to think about being a minority. And it yeah. kind of changed my thinking about that in general. Oh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had never been a minority before. Well, I don't know. You're a minority in the talent field, I think. Well, I have really good company. <laughs> <laughs>
had kids. They had they brought their children that they already had, or in some cases, they actually gave birth to children on board the vessel. Um, right? Yeah. But Betsy and her husband never had any children. So it was just, just the two of them and the crew and the whales. And um, she was, she appeared to be, according to her journal writing, she appeared to be a, a naturally cheery, warm, positive person. Uh, a lot of the, the women in their journals would write about their, the chores that they would be doing on the on ship. They'd be doing laundry or feeding the kids or whatever. And, and Betsy's entries were more about the wonderful people she met along the way, the wonderful gifts that the, 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 the natives of the various lands would give her, um, the crew members on board ship when they would uh, go ashore to get food and supplies, they would always bring her a little gift, whether it was a shell or whatever. And she was always so appreciative of even the tiniest uh, gesture. And she was uh, very much an empath and she had this equal respect for the need to, you know, hunt whales. And also she had this amazing sympathy for every whale that was killed. And in her journal, um, for every whale that was killed, she would name the whale and she would have this ink stamp of the of each whale in the journal. And then she'd write this little description or even a little poem um, sort of as an homage to the, the, the sacrifice that this whale made which was is sort of incredible. And she kept this amazing persona while being on this stinky, creaky, undulating ship with all these men and like a, an environment I could not even imagine for a day, let alone she was out for three years. I can't imagine that. I can't either. I mean, I, I it's incredible what, what these people did back then. I know. I complain when it's 50 degrees outside. It's cold to me. And I'm thinking, here's Betsy, you know, on board this ship with, you know, thousands of barrels of whale oil underneath and whale carcasses. And ugh, amazing. Can't even. No. And Joe has written beautiful music to go with it. So that is that oh, fun. I am in love with this score. I can't I wait it. to hear it. I can't wait to hear it. It's great. left field question for you that comes from a dear common friend of ours who's recovering from having his ankle fixed. Oh, Mr. David McCarty. Mr. McCarty, yes. <laughs> he, he, I, I reached out to him and I said, I need a question for Diana that just comes from somewhere else than would come from my brain. And he, he, he basically said, your music and performance preparation is unbelievable and your creative ideas are superb now it's time to know if you had the opportunity to direct a program what would you pick and why <laughs> well my preparation uh format comes from a complete fear of failure so i just prepare and prepare and prepare because i just worry that i'll show up and be horrible um 
But, you know, I do not consider myself a director, nor do I have any aspirations to be one. But if I had to direct something, I think I would direct an opera that is near and dear to me, an opera that made me a better performer and a better singer all around. Uh, and that's uh, Lucia di Lamamur of Donizetti. Mm. Um, it's not everyone's favorite opera, but I have really strong feelings about it. And I have really strong feelings about how I think it could be done that would help the audience even more figure out why Lucia is has gone crazy that she's not just a weirdo that she's been driven to it and I, I have real I have real ideas about that and now in the in the age of technology and projections that we can use instead of just people it's super doable to piece together some some uh, things that I think are missing in the opera plot wow that sounds like fun you need to maybe find a music director or artistic director you could collaborate with and do that. Maybe. You know? maybe yeah, maybe. When maybe when you're old. Which is like next, next year. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. Thank is there you. anything else you'd like to share with us today? Um... Uh, just that I, w I hope everyone can support Sea Glass Theater in any way possible. They are doing great things. Um, they are giving uh, such opportunities to young singers who need it. And, and they were so incredibly active and present during the pandemic when a lot of other companies couldn't figure out how to put one front foot in front of the other. Sea Glass was just out there doing their thing and it's uh, it's such a worthy company and i know the people that run it work very very hard so yes. i yes. will do my best to make sure that anybody i know comes to see wailing women oh lovely well we look forward to all those associates and mostly we look forward to experiencing you as betsy mori thank you <laughs>